Good evening. This is John Milburn for Laws 12066, Land Law. This is week 12, and this is our final week. For those of you that have joined me this evening, thank you very much for doing so. I appreciate the efforts that you make in joining us live. For those that are watching as a recorded session, thank you for keeping up to date with your studies. This week, we're dealing with mortgages, and this is topic 10. So we've conduct, I've conducted the course so that we're a little behind schedule, but um, making sure that we finish, um, which we will do tonight. And I should indicate that the materials that I'm using in the study guides are those provided by Dr. Nankaro, and I'm very grateful for the quality of the work, and I'm just filling in for Dr. Nankaro this unit. Now, in week 10, we deal with mortgages. And the first piece of legislation that you need to consider is the Land Title Act. If you're um, using um, a computer now in watching the uh, session, please access the Land Title Act and refer to Section 11A. And Section 11A talks about original mortgagee having an obligation to, to confirm the identity of the mortgagor. One of the problems with the uh, titles system, the Torrens title, is the possibility of fraud. And over the years, the possibility of fraud has become more real, but the safeguards used to avoid identity fraud have tightened up considerably on what they were, say, in the 80s. So Section 11A <clears throat> provides this obligation on a mortgagee to um, um, ensure that they take reasonable steps, whatever that might be, to ascertain that the person who's the mortgagee under the instrument is identical to the person who is or is about to become the registered proprietor of the lot or interest in the land. That flows on from a number of cases where um, people used improper means to obtain funds as a result of obtaining a, a mortgage over land they didn't have. And you can understand how Initially, when we had paperless titles, that was a pretty relatively easy process when um, controls were not stringent, relatively speaking. A case that you might consider in that topic is Commonwealth Bank of Australia, CBA, against Perrin, P-E-R-R-I-N, 2011, QSC 274. Now, this is a decision of... Um, Justice McMurdo, it's a very well-written decision. So Justice McMurdo um, is one that, uh, I think this was Justice Philip McMurdo, uh, one in particular that uh, you would like to, to emulate in terms of writing style. And the paragraphs that I'd like you to consider in this case are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 104, 159, and 160. In June 2008, the plaintiff bank lent $10 million to Matthew Perrin. Matthew Perrin was a Gold Coast businessman. And in fact, he was also a solicitor. However, he found that interests outside being involved as a solicitor were far more lucrative. In August 2008, the bank lent him a further $3.5 million. However, things went badly. And by March 2009, six months after receiving the $3.5 million, he filed for bankruptcy and repaid nothing. Now, at paragraph 11 of the decision, um, the court said in 1998, yes, Greg's got it. Thanks, Billabong. In 1998, he was working at Perrin Poynton. Um, Matthew Perrin became involved in what then became the private company Billabong. The business was owned by Mr. Gordon Merchant and his estranged wife when Matthew Perrin and his brother Scott acquired her 49% interest. Before long, Matthew had ceased practice as a solicitor. He was employed full-time at Billabong, became its CEO in 1999. But by the mid-2000s, Billabong was publicly floated. It was successful and immediately they became very wealthy, holding tens of millions of dollars worth of shares. Now, the bank made the loan on the faith of what appeared to be a guarantee by the defendant, 
Mr. Perrin, who was then married, um, uh, the, uh, the defendant, sorry, um, Mrs. Perrin, who was then married to Mr. Perrin. The mortgages over the house in which they lived um, was the house the, that she owned. Now, she claimed that her signatures on the documents were forgeries and she was unaware of the transactions. And the bank sued to recover under the guarantees worth more than $10 million and sought declaratory re relief as to the enforceability. It did so on alternative bases, alleging that the defendant didn't, did sign the documents or if they were signed by Matthew, that was done with her express authority pursuant to a power of attorney. And the bank cited the power of attorney in 2011. Thirdly, the bank said that Matthew Perrin had her implied authority to sign for her from all the circumstances that arose and the intermingling of finances and property. Fourthly, they said, if the documents were not signed by her with her actual authority, she became bound by them by ratifying them. So this is a very instructive case if you're looking at pleadings, how you layer the pleadings so that you're arguing in the alternative that if one doesn't apply, then perhaps the second or the third, or in this case, the fourth, might work. In fact, the, the bank had a fifth element to this case and said that it was granted at least an equitable mortgage by being provided the certificate of title, a paper title. And Matthew Perrin was able to deliver that to the bank, having collected it from the law firm, which had held it on behalf of Mrs. Perrin. And that's where the firm where his brother France, Fraser Perrin practiced. Now, it was apparently Fraser Perrin who was the witness to the defendant's signature on these critical documents. He was called, remarkably in the bank's case, to say that um, what appeared to be in each case as his signature was in fact a forgery. So now we've got Mrs. Perrin and Mr. Perrin's brother, Fraser, both saying, I didn't sign, they're forgeries. So the bank's final argument was that in order to obtain registration of mortgages to be set aside, um, something should be paid towards the principal debt. So the issue of Section 11A of the Land Title Act was relevant. And Section 185.1A of the um, Act was also relevant. Consider Section 187 that provides for a number of circumstances and ultimately where the court can make an order that it considers just. So the defendant, Mrs. Perrin, applied for an order under section 187 for the removal of the mortgages from the register. The bank's argument was that an order for the removal of the mortgages would be just, that is fair, only upon the basis of some contribution to the debt by the defendant. So in broad terms, the bank argued that it was partly her fault that the fraud was able to be perpetrated. Now, have a look at paragraph 104 of the judgment. And the court said, in summary, the reasons for the conclusions are as follows. The signature of Fraser Perrin are forgeries. In the personal circumstances of this couple and the circumstances of the financial pressure, which must have been bearing upon Matthew Perrin, there is an explanation for his deciding to forge her signatures. The court rejected all other arguments and in conclusion, they said, the bank has no indefeasible title. The plaintiff's claim against the defendant would be dismissed and the defendant had established the circumstances were sufficient that the register should be corrected to remove the bank's mortgage. So that's an interesting case um, for a number of reasons. So the question from Karen was, was I referring to section 185 or 1851A? 1851 1851A, 1 sorry. 185, 1 capital A. Okay, got that one? Thank you. All right, so have a look at that case. Have a look at the logical way in which the court set out its decision and be aware of those sections so that um, if you have a, a question that relates to mortgages and um, issues of forgery, and identification, that's where you need to look. Now, the next thing is priorities. Now, we're familiar with the Land Title Act from what we discussed in weeks one and two, 
that the issue of priorities is relevant um, for all instruments. Consider section 177, where the order of registration of instruments is in the order in which they are lodged. Um, so that's the same in the Land Act, section 298, for non tyrants And section 178 talks about the priority of registered instruments. And you'll remember this from your first assessment piece in this subject. So registration has priority according to when they're lodged, not according to when they are executed. Well, we know that, that's pretty basic by now. Subsection one. Subsection two, an instrument is taken to be lodged on the day and time endorsed on the instrument by the registrar. And subsection one is not affected by any actual implied or constructive notice. All right with that. So having re re refreshed our memory about that issue of priority and being aware that priority issues apply for mortgages, let's move on to consider once again, the issue of indefeasible title. The place we look when we're talking about the meaning for indefeasible title, of course, section 38 of the Land Title Act. So the indefeasible title for a lot are those particulars that are re recorded on the freehold land register. And instruments include a number of things, a deed of grant or certificate of title, a request, um, and then a few others, deeds, powers of attorney, um, and other documents in relation to registration. So that's again, just a refresher of the basic structure in relation to indefeasibility and priority. When we're talking about mortgages, bear in mind that there is other relevant legislation. Um, so the, registra the uh, legislation that you'd need to consider with mortgages are the Land Title Act, we've already dealt with that tonight. The corresponding provisions of the Land Act. So for example, the corresponding provision for section 177 in the LTA is 297 in the Land Act. The corresponding provision to 178 in the LTA is 298 in the Land Act. But for the most part, you can concentrate on the Land Title Act. Now, of course, you need to concentrate also on the Property Law Act and the Competition and Consumer Act incorporating the Australian Consumer Law. The ACL is almost, it's almost a bit like an implied thing that in any legal question that you answer, keep in mind the ACL as you would all of the ethical obligations that might be uh, considered relevant to a question. <clears throat> also consider the National Consumer Credit Protection Act 2009, which is Commonwealth, of course, incorporating the National Credit Code. That's particularly relevant in relation to the lending of money, which of course is closely related to the registration of mortgages. The Criminal Code, may also be relevant and there's more legislation than that. So when we're talking about mortgages, when you, th when you think about legislation, don't restrict your thinking just to the Land Title Act and the Property Law Act. Think about it more broadly than that potentially. So can anyone tell me what is a mortgage? What does it actually mean in reality? Those of us lucky to have one. Emma said, oh, just while we're waiting that, Emma said, well, we need these acts for the exam. This is the problem, isn't it, with closed, this is the problem with um, non-electronic exams. It's a real problem. Uh, the short answer is, I've asked you to consider it. I think you should really have the Land Title Act and the Property Law Act, but you can have extracts or notes in relation to the others. So, for example, I think you, you don't need to, to print the whole criminal code for a land act, land law exam. Um, the National Consumer Credit Pro Protection Act, just be aware of it, have some, maybe a printout of the section numbers. You won't need to go into a lot of detail, but that's a really good question. So thank you for ask, asking that. Okay, now what 
what is a mortgage then? Debt, says Sarah. Yep. So it's the debt that it, the mortgage is the um, security interest that typically banks or financial institutions obtain when providing funds to a borrower. Now, who's the mortgage or the borrower or the lender? The mortgage or is the borrower, the lender. Any other votes? The mortgage or is the borrower or the lender? The mortgage or. Any other votes? We're not sure. Borrower getting another vote. All right, I'll give you a little, a funny little rhyme. Mortgagee is the lender, all right, borrower. Okay, so the mortgagor is the borrower. The mortgagor is always poor. That's one way to think about it. Mortgagor is always poor, okay? Um, because you wanna make sure you get that right for the examination. So the borrower is the mortgagor. The mortgage is taken over property that is owned by the borrower as the registered proprietor, it is possible to have third party mortgages where the mortgage is taken over somebody else's property, but we'll leave that aside for a moment. So private individuals are typically the mortgagors, but private individuals can also be mortgagees. There's no rule that says that mortgage mortgages are the exclusive realm of um, banks and financial institutions. So if you're acting for someone who is involved in um, some form of credit facility or needs to, to take some form of security for a debt, then you, you're perfectly entitled to think about a mortgage in that regard. So um, grammatically, um, the mortgagee is the noun the mortgagee is the entity taking out the mortgage. All right, people sometimes use the word mortgage as a verb. Um, you know, I'm going to mortgage my property. So as opposed to the mortgage document itself. So there are a few different ways that you might use the word mortgage. Um, I mentioned also the Land Title Act and the Land Act. I said there were a few parallel provisions. What I might do is attempt to share the screen for this. I have a chart. I'm not sure if this chart is in your study guide. It might be. And um, that might be the most efficient way of doing, doing this. So while you're waiting for me to um, get this ready, if you could have a look at the Land Act and the Land Title Act, perhaps electronically. And I've just done a, a snip of some material. So it's not uh, perhaps as clear as it should be, but I'll see if this works. So can you see a little table? It's obscured in part on the left at the top, sorry. So what we have there is the Land Title Act se section 72, the counterpart is section 340 under the Land Act, which deals with the process of registering a mortgage. Section 73 of the Land Title Act, requirements of instruments of a mortgage, no counterpart in the Land Act. And I will go through these in a little more detail. Section 74 of the LTA, counterpart 341 of the Land Act, Section 75 dealing with equitable mortgages under the Land Title Act, no counterpart under the Land Act. 76 LTA amending a mortgage, counterpart 343 under the Land Act. Section 77 of the LTA amending priority of mortgages, counterpart 344 of the Land Act. Then we have section 78, which is an important provision of the Land Title Act, the powers of a mortgagee, the mortgagee being the lender, counterpart provisions of the Land Act, well, there are four of them, 345, 346, 347, and 348. Excuse me, John, um, 
it's Monique. I'm just trying to understand um, what the interaction is. So do when we're looking at an issue, do we need to consider both clauses or are they interchangeable or or what? Yep, sure. No, that's, that's good. Um, most of the question, I think you can almost guarantee that the question will relate to Torrens title, so the Land Title Act, as opposed to the Land Act, where we're dealing with the leases, uh, commercial, uh, long-term pastoral leases, those sorts of things that are, are not Torrens. So just be aware of it. Um, maybe have this sort of chart laid out for the examination purposes, but for the most part, you can rely on the Land Title Act. So it'll, either, it'll be one or either, it won't be both. I hope that helps, but thank you for that um, question. Just um, finishing off on that chart, I'll just share the screen again, so that we have section 79, LTA counterpart 350 of the Land Act, section 80, LTA, liability of a mortgagee, counterpart 349 of the Land Act, and section 81 of the LTA, releasing a mortgage, the counterpart is 342 of the Land Act. So what we might do now is have a look at the Land Title Act. So this will be really, for the most part, what you need to know. We'll start with section 72 which is mortgaging lots by registration. A lot or an interest in a lot may be mortgaged by registering an instrument of mortgage. However, a mortgagee is not an interest in a lot that can be mortgaged. So a mortgage is not an interest that can be mortgaged. So you can't mortgage a mortgage. Section 73 says, these are the requirements of instruments of mortgage. And there's a list there. Four things must be validly executed. Executed simply means signed. Include a description sufficient to identify the lot to be mortgaged. Include a description of the debt or liability secured. And include a description sufficient to identify the interest to be mortgaged. So that's section 73. Subsection one. Subsection two is also important. And it says that if the mortgagor, the borrower, is registered as a trustee, a document specifying the details of the trust or creating the trust must be deposited with the mortgage unless there are certain exceptions. But for the most part, if you're lodging a mortgage and the mortgagor is a trustee, you need to specify details of the trust or actually lodge the document, the trust document. Have a look at. Um, Section 110 of the LTA, just to digress, because it talks about instruments of transfer to a trustee. And an instrument of transfer of trust, sorry, an instrument of transfer may be lodged to transfer an interest of, in a lot to a trustee or by the owner to declare that the registered owner holds the land or lot as trustee and the um, registrar may register the instrument of transfer. And you see that in practice quite a bit where someone owns property and it says as trustee. So and then there must be some way of mechanism to identify the, the trust referred to and uh, consider section 110 of the LTA in that regard. Section 74 of the Land Title Act talks about the effect of registration of a mortgage. So a registered, a registered mortgage operates as a charge on the lot um, secured by the mortgage. So it's a legal mortgage, as opposed to an equitable mortgage that is dealt with in section 75. And section 75, and this was argued in Perrin, is it may be created by simply leaving a certificate of title with the mortgagee. We're gonna see that far less often than previously was the case with the electronic um, implementation through PEXA. Section 76 talks about amending a mortgage. Again, we probably don't see a lot of that, but the instrument of amendment, what happened then? Were you able to hear me? It just, it just vanished. So thank you all for staying online. 
I suspect as a result of this, I'm going to have to upload two sections to this um, to this session. All right, so section 77 talks about amending priority of mortgages. So you may have a first mortgage, a second mortgage, a third mortgage. You can amend that priority. That's significant, of course, because everyone who's lending, every mortgagee wants to be the first mortgagee to have first bite of the cherry in case there's not enough equity in the property to pay out the second mortgage or the third mortgage down the track. Section 78 deals with powers of mortgagees. So it's dropping out. Sorry, my, my internet must be very unstable. Let me just double check. I've got... Um, Sorry, Joe, was um, section 76 included in that as well as needing to know because I didn't hear anything about section 76. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, I'll just go back. I did talk about, I just mentioned it might have been in that hiatus. Section 76 talking about amending a mortgage. Yes. So thank you for letting me know. And I'm sorry that I keep breaking out, um, uh, dropping out. Uh, just to explain, I, I'm not quite at NBN where I am. Um, the system that I was using was overloaded. I won't mention the company. So I went to a, the competitor company to obtain some f uh, 4G device and that's that's not working as well as it should either. So we're hanging in there. We'll get to the end of the unit. Um, section 76, 77, relevant 78 deals with powers of mortgagee. So you want to have a good look at this one. A registered mortgagee of a lot has the powers and liabilities of a mortgagee, and this is significant, under the Property Law Act, Part 7. So that's the link between the Land Title Act and the Property Law Act. Without limiting subsection 1, but subject to the terms of the mortgage, if the mortgagor, the borrower, defaults under the mortgage, the mortgagee, the lender, may take possession of the lot, or may enter into possession of the lot by receiving. I am sorry. So from your perspective, I'm dropping, and that just dropped out completely. I'm not getting any notice of it. Um, are you happy to persist? And I'll, I'll try to keep going. If it drops out again, I'll have to change my, I'll, I'll start to tether and see how I go through my phone. Sorry. So section, um, 78 refers you to part 7 of the Property Law Act and it provides the options in section 78 for a mortgagee. Apart from taking the rents and profits, they may obtain possession or foreclose or seek some other order of the court. Now the relevant parts of the Property Law Act are sections 77 through to 101 inclusive. So you'll need to be aware of those sections and refer to them um, under the legislation. Now the um, section 79 deals with the transfer of a sale by a mortgagee. Section 81 talks about releasing a mortgage. And we have a case in that regard. So section 81 says, on lodging an instrument releasing a mortgage, the registrar may register the release, may release the instrument for all of the mortgage or one of the mortgagors. And the case is Collette and another against Knox, K-N-O-X and another, 2010 QSC 253. So that's Collette and another against Knox, 2010 QSC 253. Okay, so here's the background. Um, it was a family provision case, so someone challenging a will. And his honour made an order that created a life interest and made orders for the distribution of the estate amongst the family. Now the respondents, uh, sorry Sarah, it's just dropping out, is it? So... Collette and another against Knox, 2010 QSC 253. The background, it was a family provision case 
and the court made a life interest order distributing the estate amongst family. Now, the respondents in the case incurred legal fees of about $70,000, which was nearly a third of the estate, so a very small estate and a large legal bill. His Honour Justice McMeekin said at paragraph four of the judgment that the complicating feature of the case was that the respondents contended the entire amount of cash money in the estate had been expended principally on litigation. They'd taken out a mortgage over the deceased property to secure repayment of those legal fees. And the respondents contended that the court's hands were tied, no life interest could be granted because of these legal costs. And the court rejected that, yeah, shades of blacker, rejected that view. Now, have a look at the order in part. Look at order number two relevant to this case. Uh, His Honour said, the respondents caused to be released the mortgage over the property by lodging an instrument required under Section 81 of the Land Title Act and to discharge personally any liability associated with that mortgage. So that's a sober warning for lawyers who think, well, we might be able to take a mortgage over the property. That may be reversed as a result of uh, an order of the Supreme Court as it was in that case. Um, So I've mentioned when you look at the Property Law Act, which is really the other key piece of legislation, section 77 through to 101. I'm not going to walk you through each of those. You'll be pleased to hear. But I will select and we'll go through a couple. So firstly, let's look at section 82. And that deals with tacking and further advances. So what tacking means is this. If you have a mortgage for $100,000 and then you have a second mortgage for $50,000 and then you borrow an extra $50,000 from the first mortgagee so that the mortgage amount has now gone up from $100,000 to $150,000, the question is all about the priority um, and the extent to which the prior mortgagee can take $150,000 when the second mortgagee took its money or made its um, advance when the first mortgage was 100. So this is the issue of tacking and further advances. So, John? Yeah, lost again? Yeah. Is it worth maybe turning your video off? That might just help the internet. I'll do that. That's a good idea. Thank you very much. I'll do that now. All right. It won't make any difference. You can still hear me. Can you hear me okay? All good? All right. Thank you very much. That's a great suggestion. So Section 82 says that a prior mortgagee shall have the right to make further advances to rank in priority to subsequent mortgages, whether legal or equitable, but only in certain circumstances. And they are if an arrangement has been made to that effect or the mortgagee had no notice of subsequent mortgages at the time when it made the further advances or whether the mortgagee's mortgage imposes on the mortgagee an obligation to make those further advances. Other than that, the tacking rules and the priority rules mean that the first mortgagee will only gain priority for the first, in my example, $100,000. Then the the second mortgagee would have its security for fifty, dollars and only after that would the first mortgagee have security for the additional 50 that it tacked on and advanced. So that's important, but more important in terms of practice and assessment are sections 84 and 85 of the Property Law Act. Have a look at these sections carefully. And they're to do with exercising power of sale. Now, mortgagees who face a mortgagor in default have a number of alternatives available to them. One is to exercise a power of sale. What that means is that in essence, the mortgagee takes physical possession of the property and arranges typically an auction of that property, which we call a mortgagee sale, and sells the property directly to the buyer. The mortgagor is out of the process other than 
the mortgagor has an entitlement to receive any money that's left after, after the mortgage is paid out, interest is paid, legal costs are paid, then an agents are paid. If there's anything left, then the mortgagor might receive it, that money. So in order to stop mortgagees from um, simply selling the property cheaply, you know, just enough to get their money, there are rules about having a duty um, and they can in part in uh, section 85. Now, before I mention part, part section 85, you will note that in section 84, there's reference to a notice of default being in the pro approved form. Can you see that in subsection two of section 84? And just bear in mind that a notice of default may be in form four and the forms are approved under Section 350 of the Property Law Act. So that's just the technical how these forms come into existence. The Land Title Act ensures that a mortgagee exercising power of sale is able to sell from liability in respect of subsequent mortgages and equitable mortgagees' caveats. Therefore, it is not necessary to obtain releases of subsequent mortgages or equitable mortgagees' caveats. Refer to Sections 79 and 124, subsection 2C of the Land Title Act. Does that make sense? So if you have a mortgagor with two mortgages, the first mortgagee exercises power of sale, that mortgagee will use a Form 4 notice of, um, uh, will, will issue the notice of default, but in exercising the power of sale, can sell the property free of any liability to the second mortgagee. Now, the duties. I mentioned Section 85. Mortgagees have a duty in relation to selling the property. And those duties are contained in that section. I won't go through it in total, but I will refer you to a case. And this is Commercial and General Acceptance. CGA against Nixon, 1981, HCA 70, or if you like, the authorised citation for commercial and general acceptance against Nixon is 1981, 152, CLR 491. Okay, so what was this about? <clears throat> so there's a statutory duty to take reasonable care to ensure that property is sold at a market value. In this case, according to the, um, the findings, competent agents were engaged. However, they failed to advertise the auction adequately. And the question is, was the mortgagee liable for that failure by the agents? Now, CGA, as the mortgagee in possession of the respondent's land, exercised the power of sale. And it did employ this firm of real estate agents to conduct the sale. They instructed that the sale should be advertised in the Courier Mail. But one, one advertisement published in the newspaper was unsatisfactory in a number of respects. So the question is, should the mortgagee be held liable for the loss suffered by the respondents because the property was sold at less than market value? Obviously, this went to the High Court. Have a look at paragraph four. Paragraph 7. They're the two relevant paragraphs. And what the High Court did was discuss the nature of the relationship between the mortgagee and the mortgagor and said that a mortgagee is not a trustee. However, it is clear that in conducting a sale of the mortgage property is not entitled to sacrifice the interest of the mortgagor in the surplus of the proceeds of the sale the mortgagee must exercise the power in good faith. There are statutory provisions, but there are also common law positions. The question um, about that obligation was earlier considered in uh, previous cases, but this case made it clear that the duty of the mortgagee exercising power of sale is to take reasonable care to ensure the property is sold at market value. Have a look then also at paragraph seven, where the court said, I consider the words of the subsection 
imposing a mortgagee exercising power of sale a duty higher than merely to select a proper person. The duty is to take reasonable care to ensure the property is sold at the market value. The mortgagee is not discharged from that duty simply by delegating to another, whether that's an agent or an independent contractor. And that's at page 498. Um, have a look also at section 88 of the Property Law Act, which deals with the application of the proceeds of sale. So firstly, in paying all the costs and expenses incurred by the mortgagee in trying to sell the property. Secondly, in discharging of the mortgage property with interests and costs. And then thirdly, in payment of subsequent mortgages or encumbrances. And only then, if there's anything left over, does the mortgagor receive anything. Now, apart from the statutory provisions in the Property Law Act and the Land Title Act, I referred you to the consumer protection legislation and the Australian Consumer Law, you'll recall, is Schedule 2 to the Competition and Consumer Act 2010, Commonwealth. So the Australian Consumer Law is a schedule to the Competition and Consumer Act 2010. Also consider the National Consumer Credit Protection Act 2009, which includes the National Credit Code, the NCC. Now, I'm going to direct you to the relevant section so you don't have to print out all of it. Under the Competition and Consumer Act, the relevant sections, now this is not the um, consumer law, this is the act itself. Have a look at part 2.1 dealing with misleading or deceptive conduct. Specifically, look at section 18. In part 2.2, dealing with unconscionable conduct, in the Act, have a look at sections 20, 21, 22 and 22A, which deal generally with issues of unconscionable conduct and presumptions relating to whether representations are misleading. In part 2.3, dealing with unfair contract terms, look at sections 23, 24 and 25. Now, that's all you really need to consider under the Competition and Consumer Act for the purposes of this unit. As far as the National Credit Code is concerned, um, look at the National Consumer Credit Protection Act 2009 Commonwealth and look at section three that deals with the introduction of the National Credit Code, which has effect as law of the Commonwealth. Under the Act, look at chapter three, dealing with responsible lending conduct, and specifically look at sections 111 through to 164. Now, you may not need to go into a lot of detail, but be aware of 111 through to 164 inclusive because they collectively deal with the issue of responsible lending conduct and those requirements that apply to credit conducts, contracts that are secured by way of a mortgage. So chapter three, responsible lending conduct, 113 to 164 inclusive. Finally, um, look at issues to do with dealing with a difficult mortgagor. A mortgagee must consider its obligations under the National Credit Code and also the Criminal Code. So I'll deal with those now. National Credit Code Section 88 deals with enforcement of a mortgage. And subsection 2 says, a credit provider must not begin enforcement proceedings against a mortgage order to recover payment of money subject to a mortgage unless three things have been attended to. Number one, the mortgage order is in default. That's the first, not most obvious. Number two, the credit provider has given the mortgage order a default notice and then at least 30 days notice to remedy the default. Number three, the default has not been remedied within that period. Here's an interesting kicker. 
there's a criminal penalty applies if a credit provider fails to fulfil those obligations. 50 penalty units as a criminal penalty. And just be aware that the default notice referred to in section 88, subsection 2C, or sorry, um, in, in section 88.2, must comply with section 88.3. And Karen says, thank you, Karen, penalty unit is $130.55. Is that the Commonwealth penalty unit or the state penalty unit? Queensland, yeah. Not sure um, whether, I'm, I'm just trying to think whether, I should know this, whether there is a specific Commonwealth penalty unit regime or whether the penalty, I think probably in that act, there, there's likely to be a reference to the prosecution of the matter in state jurisdiction, in which case the Penalties and Sentences Act state would apply. So thank you for that, Karen. Now, the other obligation on mortgagees dealing with a difficult mortgagor relate to the criminal code. And I'll only give you one section that you need to consider in this regard, and it's section 70, 70, which deals with the issue of forcible entry. Now, I mentioned that in the event of a mortgagor defaulting, the mortgagee can take action. One of those things is to take possession. But from a practical perspective, mortgagors don't often give up their castle lightly. So we may have a difficult situation. And section 70 of the code says that any person who in a manner that is likely to cause or cause reasonable fear or unlawful violence to a person enters onto land commits a misdemeanor. And it is immaterial whether the person is entitled to enter the land or not, that's subsection two. So the situation becomes obviously difficult for the agents of a mortgagee, they, can't, they must take care not to contravene section 70 of the code. So the mortgagee should sensibly seek an order of the court and then enlist the services of um, enforcement agencies. So this is the very last thing that I'll tell you in this week's work, which means it's the last thing that I'll tell you in this unit. And it's a case. The case is Westpac Banking Corporation against Claric, K-L-R-A-I-C, 2018, QSC 38. So Westpac against Claric, K-L-A-R-I-C, 2018 QSC 38. So an originating application was uh, presented to the court in January this year by Westpac. Westpac sought orders of possession, sought orders to restrain the occupants and the bank filed affidavits. In this case, the default was over a period of five years. So what was Westpac's position in this? They said, well, or it rather said, Mr. Claric had engaged in a, in a protracted and vexatious course of conduct, which was apparently designed to frustrate or delay the enforcement of the mortgage. Westpac submitted and the court accepted that the course of conduct was ongoing and gave rise to a reasonable apprehension that without the injunction of the court, the respondent would simply take further steps to interfere or obstruct Westpac in trying to take physical possession and sell the property. And without Westpac's permission, Mr. Claric had permitted others to reside in the property. Justice Atkinson said a few things. The first is that the jurisdiction of the court to make this order was invoked not under the National Credit Code, not under the Property Law Act, but under Section 78 2C of the Land Title Act. That's the section that gave the court power to make its decision. Look at paragraph 8 of the judgment. It said the Supreme Court is a court of competent jurisdiction. The District Court also has jurisdiction to hear matters if the amount does not exceed the monetary limit, $750,000. And the jurisdiction does not oust the Supreme Court's jurisdiction. Constitution Act, section 58. Okay, so we can deal with this in the Supreme or the District Court. This one was in the Supreme Court. At paragraph 12, Her Honour said, in addition to the contractual provisions under the mortgage, 
uh, mortgagee is bound by the provisions of the Property Law Act and Section 88 of the National Credit Code. Then at paragraph 13, Her Honour said, Section 84 of the Property Law Act provides that a mortgagee shall not exercise the power of sale where the default has been made in payment unless notice is given, etc. And then paragraph 25 says, Westpac to have given notice to a tenant prior to um, obtaining possession under section 317 of the Residential Tenancies and Rooming Accommodation Act, notice has been given um, and was evidenced. So in that case, Westpac um, would potentially need um, an enforcement warrant pursuant to Rule 9132 of the Uniform Civil Procedure Rules. So that's in paragraph 25 of the judgment. So that's all you really need to know from that. But you'll see when I said these various sections and um, statutes that might apply, we even got down so far as to saying the Uniform Civil Procedure Rules have something to play uh, in these procedures. All right. Well, thank you very much. You've been really patient. I'm sorry it's been a long session. Hopefully it wasn't too tedious. The final examination requires you to answer one question, which is from memory worth a bit more than the others, double I think, and it will either be mortgages or easements. All right. I'm going to just risk sharing the video for a moment. I'm still here. Are there any questions, comments about tonight's work or the unit generally? Just a quick one, John. Um, it's been fairly in depth this unit with a massive amount of different pieces of legislation to look at. Um, is there any likelihood that you might put a list up at some stage as to what we should be looking at to take into the exam? Because I mean, at the moment I've got a pile about three quarters of a foot high of acts that mm. I should be taking in, I think. Yeah, um, that's a very good, that's a very good question. I'm not a real fan of these invigilated examinations, but we have to sit for, we, we have, we're prescribed to give it. Um, I'm not sure that I can give any hints beyond what I've already done, Scott. I'm sorry. I know that's not what you'd like to hear, but I'm not sure I can. I'll give it some thought, but I think I'm probably stuck and no. But thank you. Any other questions? All good? Okay. All right. Well, thank you again for your patience this evening. I'll wrap up tonight. I'll upload probably a few sessions as a result of the breakdown. If you haven't had your say, please do so. And it's been great to be your unit coordinator. Very thankful for Dr. Nankaro letting me do that this unit. Okay. Uh, John, yes, just um, yes, go before you go, if I can just have a chat to you uh, when everyone else drops off, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. I'll stay on the line. Okay. Thank you, thank you Scott. All right. All the best. Um, thank you. And I'll stop the recording now, but I'll stay on the line, Scott. Thank you. Bye then. Hey, John, nothing, nothing. Uh, Sorry, Scott, I, just, I just have to.